Welcome to Your Town and the Arts are the Answer segment. I'm Paulette Lynch with the Arts Council for Monterey County, where we really believe the arts are the answer. So that's our total focus, and uh, we care about everything happening in the arts in Monterey County and bring you something about that every single month according to a theme. And today's theme is poetry. National Poetry Month is all of April. So what you're gonna see today is also uh, Poetry Out Loud, the competition that we just had, a national competition hosted by Garland Thompson, who first brought it to us. One of the greatest things about being in Monterey County is that people are coming from all over the world and they choose to live here. They've gone on many adventures and they come back, they share what they've known, and in many cases start something brand new. So today we're going to also be talking to Heidi McGuerin and we're actually going to talk with her first. She is an artist, a painter, a photographer, and a poet, and as well as a really gifted teacher. So Heidi, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Paula. It's so, so great that you were able to squish us in. I know you have so many adventures yet to come and lots of things going on in your life. And, um, but let's talk, let's talk first about the poetry reading that you did fairly recently um, at All Capital Books, right? Mm -hmm. And what can you it? talk about how did you, how did they invite you? How did they find you? Well, maybe about a, a year and a half ago, someone um, suggested to Robert Nielsen that he should um, find out about me belonging to the Monterey Poetry Consortium. And um, the next thing I knew, I was invited to read with Garland yeah. Thompson. Okay. And we had a wonderful reading, and it was fun. And I've read some of at Garland Thompson's readings. I've read a little bit, and I've read here and there. In the beginning, I was kind of so shy that I'd read without telling anyone who I was or oh. my name. <laughs> and I would kind of do it anonymously oh. because I was terrified of the yeah. stage and the mic. But then I realized it was really fun and it wasn't so scary That's at all. That's wonderful. And I felt like it, people would encourage me to say it's important that people hear your work. So I've just gotten a little bit looser about it. And then I was invited to San Francisco to read at North Beach by the um, poet laureate uh, Jack um, Jack Hirschman, wow, and so I wonderful. read in San Francisco in, in the Monterey in the North Beach Library, and I was born on Lombard Street, and it's kind of unusual because the library's on Lombard. It was full house, That's lots of fun, had a nice mic, yeah. and it wasn't scary at all. Uh -huh. Lots of roses, Aww. lots of love, so it was really fun. And I read with a wonderful poet up there, so we both shared our space. And then I was invited again to read down here, and it was really fun. So I've had, I really enjoyed it, and I write a lot. I write all the time. Well, we have so much to talk about, so many of your poems and adventures that either inspired them or just mm -hmm. got them going, brought them to life in some way. Um, could we open with the, um, the poem that you have right there? Yeah. This is called Many Black Journals. Many black journals, a deep red textured smooth feel surround me. I seem to breathe inside the many pages, some faded, of my many attempts at so many stages of my life. Pencils and soft blue ink fades, it seems, over time, leaving only a parchment of memory staring at me, making me wonder. Often life, daily life, twists of emotion catch my mind. Some thoughts of those times dangle in the air and catch my attention years later. A quiet place to breathe, a safe one to remember. For years, these journals piling up next to one another caught dust as they sat close together. Their many traveling sleeping gently between once loved pages of frantic writing and necessary scribblings those moments often uncontrolled and private, not understood then, come to light anew, and it seems bursts of their me rememberings float up into my mind years later and help my blood flow more easily as I realize I've come this far. In these pages, birds sing, tears fall, romance seems dreams away, and dear friends visit me once again. 
Our minds float in forever landscapes of colorful meanderings, mysterious creations of curiosity. Words pour out of our bodies as raindrops pour down from the sky, our fingers racing to keep up with our minds. The dance of a typewriter excited me years ago, feeling my dance steps flooding my body and traveling out through my fingers. No planning, no cautions, just letting go, a dance of the keys. Life's journey seems to pour out of me onto fresh pages with a fervent necessity, no one watching, pouring struggles and p pleasures onto pages of life bringing breath to the soft cotton smoothness that once lay naked and bare. Streaks of, it, streaks of ink, black and blue, sepia for me, opening up possibility and imagination. The words that s appear seem to jump out of my skin, sometimes as a whisper, some other times as a conga drum. Words are magical and can trick your emotions, create flight and freedom, never knowing exactly anything. We travel alone on our journeys as if we are lucky. Words, if we are lucky, words pour out of us, giving us a vehicle to ride on our travels, reins to hold on to. Wow, Heidi, that is so gorgeous. And it really seems like that could be an opening poem to almost any volume of poetry, talking about um, just the value of the words and what it does for the writer, but also I can tell you as a listener, as a reader, so many things conjure immediately, and I felt the whole time how lucky we are to have words. <laughs> there was something I heard on my way here this morning that was about um, uh, how, how are people different from from the rest of the animals and and I realized that's you were you're speaking that words you know the capacity to think differently think at different times to evoke the past to evoke the uh, imagine the future it's it's all there that's so you amazing can fly. so amazing <laughs> thank you so much for sharing that um, so that's one of the ones that you read at the um, mm -hmm. at the old Capitol books. Mm -hmm. Do you do you find you turn to that often? Like, do you open many readings with that? No, I always change my poems. Oh, all I see. my readings have been completely different. Because it's something I, I could just imagine everybody should like read it once a week or something. I don't know. It just really feels like a really great thing to just stay just rooted wrote in this, those ideas. This was last Friday. Is that true? Yeah. <laughs> no, I've never written. Wow, yeah. oh, it's just exquisite. So, um, ex especially for today, you know, our, our theme, but I just keep feeling of it as like a, uh, it's an opening, you know, to, to s an opening reflection, really. So thank you again. Um, now, you have had adventures all over the world, really. Well, South America, mostly, and Mexico, and Cuba, and Haiti. And, uh, but you also have a very deep connection to this area. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about, you were born in San Francisco, and eventually, mm -hmm. but you're connected here, you know, in, well, in my, lots of ways. So mm -hmm. can you talk about that just a little bit? Well, my great-grandfather, um, Frank Powers, founded Carmel, uh -huh. and my aunt, Lolly Madeline built Nepenthe. Isn't that amazing? And I used to run away all the time from San Francisco. <laughs> and my that mother. really ran away? Did she not know I really did run away. <laughs> well, she, That's uh, so amazing. She never spoke again. <laughs> oh, my God. I ran away because I loved Big Sur. Yeah. I loved the wilds. Yeah. I loved the ocean and the mountains. I felt like I needed it. And I love animals a lot. Yeah. So animals and um, feeling safe there. And I built a house there, and I lived there. And Mostly artists were there during that time, and Edmund Cara, the wonderful sculptor, yeah. and Emil White, and Emil Norman, and uh, Henry Miller, all kinds of people were really close to my family. And Lolly and Bill, they did the sandpiper down there with, and Martin Ransohoff was one of my neighbors, yeah. the property, at his where he lived. 
and um, it was wonderful. I, I didn't see any reason to go back to the city. <laughs> I loved it. My mother once came to visit when I wasn't there, only once, uh -huh. and took all my clothes out of my closet and filled them with city clothes. Oh, my goodness. That's and right. um, that was it. And I, I, I was just horrified. <laughs> that was it. But That's I stayed. That's so amazing. So do you have any poems for us today that, that um, are connected to that time, especially? Um, or connected to Big Sur? Let's see. Maybe, um, maybe not so much. Oh, I have a beautiful one, Big Sur. It's in the other room. I have one connected to horses and all around yeah, here. Yeah, let's do that one. Yeah. Okay. The old man read his friend a rabbit his story. Magic stirs in the middle of the night when children sleep and horses' eyes are closed. When waters burst from the sky, rattling the tin roofs with thunderous applause. Clouds dispersed into ribbons of memories, pouring water out of the heavens, turning mountaintops to snowy peaks, white blankets of forgiveness, covering endless miles as far as one can see. The valleys below glow verdant green, emerald isles of glistening, soaking the land, giving birds new grasses and food. Many animals nestle somewhere below, the mud was slippery and full of hoof prints as Val wrestled the big black truck carefully up the mountain roads. Seven Morgans, two are young babies, herd bound with five other beauties run loose and free, rushing up that tall rolling green hill under a blooming cloud-filled sky. They look up from far below when the shrill of my voice, my calling, Tricotti and Cortez, lift their heads suddenly and disrupts their reverie. They rush suddenly between them, their heads held high. They all run up the mountainside together in a rhythm. My arms are opened wide as I call their names. Tintin, I noticed racing back and forth above me, my little schnauzer. Like a dog working horses, he thinks. Back and forth, his little white body running around, in and around, long legs and tremendous energy. The clue, energy. Carrots and lure of del deliciousness spread out in huge separate piles alongside bright colored buckets of oats and green fields with the treats they see only. And there, there appears on the mountaintops in the midst of the oats and carrots seven beautiful r horses rush around me pushing against me often, their soft, firm, thick weights against my body like no other. The whinny, the nibbles, the teeth, treats got him nipping and pulling playfully on my sweater he loves so much, makes me laugh. He and I have old collected memories together, Trigati. Our eyes catch and we know. The rain dumped clouds of water on top of all of us. White clouds, darkest gray clouds, black clouds opened up and soaked us. The ground was soggy with water. Suddenly laughter from deep inside felt nurturing and real. I never told Trigotti and Cortez about the latest gossip from the barn they left days ago. A mule named Rascal, a recent visitor to the stable, was settling in between Lollipop a sweet, lovely paint, and a gray speckled workhorse who still pulls the plow, owned by a quiet old man. Rascal was bored. He managed to eat the tails off of Lollipop and the old man's horse up to the end of the tailbone. Both horses looked ridiculous. I couldn't stop laughing at first. Then I realized and was horrified. A wide plywood wall was installed in between them, and by the fourth day, there were bigger ponds of nibbling and chewing all around the board, and created easy windows for Rascal to put his head through. Rascal has created a situation for himself. He cannot go out to pasture because the horses don't want their tails eaten off. I noticed the old gray speckled horse of the old man has been moved somewhere else only lollipop next to Rascal. He is three. He's bored, funny, and not so funny. 
He really loves carrots and apples, and he loves me. He talks to me with his big, soft, furry lips and throws his head high in the air with a twist to accentuate his delight with himself. Someone listen to me. Now he has a nice wire fence. He can see lollipop through, and his belly needs a flush. That's phenomenal. Well, thank you so much. It is so great to be able to hear you speak these poems as well. It's, it's really phenomenal. Um, is there another one that you'd really like to share with us? Maybe about the border and the yeah, immigration. Yeah, so can you set it up for us? Like, where, um, when did you write it, and what was it? In November. What, what, what November. was inspiring your, your thoughts along these lines? Well, around the time that the children were all taken away from their parents, mm -hmm. and I heard about what was going on on the border, I just went right back into all the people I love so much from South America and these kind families who are so much kinder than we are, really, and so much more generous. And remembering when I went with the Red Cross to Watsonville after the earthquakes, mm -hmm. the people that I went to help were sharing their food with me. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And um, I just love these people and the idea of our country. Um, doing something so horrifying is just unthinkable to me. So I um, I just wrote a poem. And you've you spent a lot of time, right, traveling I lived in Chile. So and you lived in Chile I've for I've been a all over Brazil yeah. and, um, and um, Mexico. I used to go with the flying doctors, yeah. and we'd go to little villages, and I'd be the translator and the scout, and then I'd collect people in the morning and bring them to the doctors. and. And there it would was be just dozens most, of people? or um, As people? many people in the town as we could gather. Wow. So the word would come out that the planes were landing sure, sure, sure. in these little villages. <laughs> and um, people would show up, in oh. just lots of people. In one, Isla de Cedros, which is in the tip of Baja, they let the prisoners out. Wow. Uh, yeah, they let them out to come down. To and, go, oh, wow. And, um, We'd have to hold them on the table because they'd all want to jump off the table. <laughs> are the men afraid? are big babies. Men are huge babies. <laughs> were they afraid or they just didn't like They the were terrified, uh, but they wanted their, they opened their mouth and you almost passed out. Their breaths were horrible. There were big black holes. And sure, sure. I mean, a lot of them didn't have half of their. T t so we tried to help. We'd pull teeth if we had to, or mm -hmm. we'd try to mend them. The doctors were really. Mm -hmm. I used to write the stories about these trips. So I was the writer, the photographer, That's so the amazing. gatherer. And the interpreter. Yeah, and the interpreter. I just, uh, and, and the I, scout, you said. And the scout. Well, to find the village, because <laughs> you'd be up in the air looking, and the pilot's busy, right, trying to. <laughs> and the planes are going like this, because we're way up in the mountains. <laughs> It was really fun. In Sonora, it was wonderful. I just loved it. These That's magical such a wild, villages. I have to say, this a wild picture of you're just in that little tiny plane, right? And looking little up, saying, plane. "Well, there's some people." And then, and when you arrived, I'd people welcomed church. you, though, right? Oh, They're well, they loved. Oh, they couldn't. People are so loving. Uh, I used to go down to Soledad to the prison, and they'd uh -huh. let me in uh, to the uh, room where the the men on right on the best behavior were about to get out, which made me nervous about saying my name. And um, they would um, let me in there to do a, sl I'd do a slideshow oh, yeah. of, they would do the grinding of the lenses uh -huh. in the oh, prison. Gosh. And then we'd go and collect all the lenses and find and put them in glasses. And then we'd take them down to Mexico. So I'd go with dentists wow. and eye doctors. That is amazing. And so we'd do a dental thing on one, wherever yeah. we were, and eye doctors. And I try to find matching. So when, when I actually was in Mexico, like these old father and mother would come in, old people that are cooking and knitting and doing all these things, and they couldn't see. Yeah. And so I try to find matching <gasps> glasses, little gold oh, yeah. frames. for. I mean, I try to make them really pretty. Well, because you're an artist also, well, you're <laughs> thinking about those kinds of things. Isn't that wonderful? And well, they bring their kids, and so I'd always took a lot of um, We only had like six pounds per person. I'd, so I'd have my camera and very little clothes wow. because the plane could only hold. We held three people. We'd have the doctor, me, the scout, and the pilot, and then the other was for the supplies. Amazing. And little Cessnas, we'd go down. It was really the most fun thing I've ever done. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs>
track. It was really fun. I never told anyone where I was going. I never told my kids I was leaving the country. <laughs> they wouldn't let you go. <laughs> well, they, they would. Not great, a Mom. Would go. No, a they, I loved little planes. Oh. I've been in Cuba. I've been in planes that going yeah. like this. Phenomena. Well, thank you so much. So if you would share that, uh, what's the title of this one? Uh, across Our Border. Across our border, not far from where we sleep, children and families are piling up, huddled against one another. Hope had not a possibility in these moments of dark despair. Courage brought them hundreds of miles from rumors heard in the streets, in their towns, their doorways, over their fences, danger alert in the shadows, babies being birthed in silence, children grabbed onto mother's skirts, and brothers and sisters small hands innocent and feeling a wave of fear and necessity climbing on top of wild reckless trains praying to stay up top so many people on this earth displaced by madness predators next to warblers are these families the very same ones who fed our bodies traveling to the unknown small villages of their other landscape who fed us and showed us to safety when the night fell upon us and we not knew not where we were? Darkness, candles, and kindness. If we piled up millions of us on the border, would we be safe? Our way of life suddenly feels threatened, not by the ones asking for help, but by our military forces following orders of madness to starve them out, run them down, build walls that hold nothing but imagination. People, languages, faces, familiar, music, foods, loved, are left behind, way behind, along with all their possessions on their journey to the never-never land. Once, where their homes provided rough makeshift shelters, a precious home, a landscape of possibility. I've wandered these countries, aware but not chaste. I shared bread and smiles with so many indigenous people and felt their kindness warm my body when I felt frozen in fear. I've been there, but I did not suffer the pain of a forever pilgrimage to nowhere, a place of no hope or possibility as rain pours on the edges of our state. My mind wonders how far, how far is this machine of ours willing to push against this dilapidated caravan of human beings with no protection, destroyed dreams, no food, diapers, warm clothes, sad, sad circumstances. I wonder, I wish I could find an answer. So powerful, thank you, Heidi. So, um, one of the poems that I noticed you have is uh, "My Secret Garden." Here, it's very tantalizing. What um, what one is that about, and um, when when did you first write that? It's about me and growing up, and what I felt when I think back to my garden of my childhood, and where I felt safe and where I didn't feel safe. Do you mind sharing that with us too? Okay. And can you talk a little bit about where you, when you this is when you're in San Francisco? Yes, I lived. I, I oh, I grew up in San Francisco, and um, I had a, quite an interesting, fancy life. I had everything in the world, and I felt very spoiled and embarrassed. Oh. And um, my family did everything in the world for me, and they sent me to private schools. I rode beautiful, beautiful horses. I traveled um, to Europe and um, on beautiful sailboats. And, I mean, I had fancy <laughs> life, and I was a cotill in the cotillion, which totally oh, embarrassed me and horrified me. At sixteen or so, is that um, when they do that? About I don't know, <laughs> seventeen, eighteen, <laughs> and um, I was sent to Foxcroft in Virginia to school to a fancy girls' school, and all I wanted to do was ride and be in the art department because they had <laughs> wonderful <laughs> supplies and and. I um, but I had a, my mother was really really strict, and um, I felt very confined. Mm -hmm. And everything I wanted to know, I, I was the shadows. I went to art school in San Francisco. I went to the, it, at the time was the California School of Fine Arts, and um, later the San Francisco Art Institute. And I loved that. It was just my shelter. 
and um, but I felt like the things I really loved I had to kind of keep secret and one day I'd had it so I, and I didn't have any money yeah. and I had already lived in South America or been to South America uh -huh. and traveled the first time I went I was in a wedding in Chile oh, yeah. and so um, and I ended up going to Argentina and the more I stayed down there the more I met people and liked it and then I went to um, Uruguay and then I went to Brazil and then I went, I didn't want to come home. Oh, wow. and at the time, you could switch your ticket. Oh, so without God. telling, and I had, um, so then I ended up crossing the country and going back to Peru. And was this months and months or years and years? This was months and months. This was like, well, I don't know, I can't remember really, but maybe two months. And my mother was writing frantic letters, come I home immediately. <laughs> and I went to oh, Bolivia, and so I went to Peru, and I went up in the mountain. I met a girl who was, um, I stayed with the uh, Swedish ambassador. Wow. Um, in Brazil, in Rio, and she took me to Macumbas and turned me on to all this black magic, and we took black oh, candles, yes, and I yeah. had to wear long skirts. We crawled up dark mountains in the nighttime wow. and had amazing experiences with the birds flying all over, and people, men were, they were throwing oil, hot burning oil wow. on fi down their throats and sort of proving themselves, and women were coming and dancing and holding the men, and I, it was just amazing the dancing and the birds and the the head the head man there, the high priest's wife sat with me and explained she could speak some English and she'd been sent to England to learn medicine yeah. so that she could bring it back to her people. So I had all of that infused in me, and it was just amazing. And his um, secretary was from Scotland, Fiona. And he introduced me to her, so she and I wanted to do the same thing. So she and I flew back to Peru. Oh, my goodness. And then we went into Bolivia, and we stayed with um, some embassy people. And they took us in Land Rovers all to these lakes, fishing, and the Peace Corps. We, we knew uh, a lot of the Peace Corps yeah. people. And they knew the inside of everything, like what to be yeah, careful, yeah, what was poison, yeah. be careful. Their best, their best. Uh, they were so much fun. Yeah. And we'd fish and fish and fish and not catch a thing. And then this little boy who we'd seen at the bottom of the mountain with this herd of llamas uh -huh. would come up out of nowhere with this little <laughs> string in his pocket and his little hat. He was tiny and he was fascinated. Where were we going? Yeah. And every lake in Bolivia, every lake we went to got bigger and bigger. Wow. So the fish, wow. I th in my imagination, got bigger. And, <laughs> and I always was a weaver, and I've always loved yeah. natural. Uh, I've always woven and made my own colors. And um, down there, it was it came alive in me. I realized that I felt like I'd been there. I felt like I was wow. probably an Inca in another life yeah, felt because like it made sense to me, yeah. everything. Yeah. Cuba also made sense to me. I felt like I'd lived there. I knew it. When I got there, my paintings were that way. Yeah. The colors and all that. Um, so would you share that yeah. with us now? And can you repeat the title? My Secret Garden. A small drawing on a mysterious piece of fragile note paper. Castles of lines drawn in intimate sketches. Imagining who the poet who lived inside those moments a fragile, gentle, secretive man hiding his identity in the lines gathered in a bouquet of small, tender beauty. The garden was my safety place where the green grasses grew and the bugs fluttered in the moist air. Words, unnecessary lines, crisscrossed the skin of the paper, wiggles of meaning. The back garden was my toy shop, the old face of a wizard tucked into the ivy, spouted water into a deep basin and made me wonder. The tall, steep brick stairway beyond led to a small studio way up high between the cypress trees. There I could take my letters and my small pieces of pleasure with me to discover inner worlds where no one else was around. Strangers unknown to me reach out of somewhere far away across timeless waters of atmosphere, comforting my insecure being with praise. I do not know their pain, only my own. My words I share the same way I share a painting, a photograph of treasure that travels out into the ether and draws unknown before beings into my atmosphere of wonder. I wander. I remember toys, shreds of ragged cloths, Soft colors faded some time ago. 
I remember castles, strong palaces of ego's creation in foreign lands. I treasure more the tiny lines of palaces created on paper skin, soft, that my cousin Kaif used to send to me. Magical kingdoms of tiny happenings stirring my imagination and warming my coldness, waking me up to enchantment, stirring my artist in me, the part of me that felt sad and unrecognized at home, and led me into paradise, which opened the gates of flowers of wonder, the singing of birds, secrets, the treasure of chained strangers unknown before, my secret garden, a hidden gate, my secret life. Mm. That's exquisite. So Heidi, can you tell us a little bit about what's next for you? What are you going to be up to soon? Read more readings, more adventures, more? M more writing. Scouting. I just love to write <laughs> right now. I love uh -huh. to write and I'm with horses almost every day. Oh, I love you to are? Oh, yeah. I'm and, um, Begin riding them again, which I hadn't been for, oh, for a long time, but I grew up riding horses yeah. always around. But I, they all know me. They all whinny when they see me coming. I'm the treat lady, and I love them, and I talk to them. My grandson doesn't understand that. He's really 10 years old and questioning, yeah. how do you talk to animals? What do you think you're doing? <laughs> I said, they talk to me. I said, he's fascinated. Oh, that's and I love them all, so I try to help people that need help. Everybody mm -hmm, needs mm -hmm. help that has a horse at feeding or being there and back up. So now, I also know that you are, you're still going to do your class, right? You have one oh, class. Oh, I teach a darling doing. little class of poetry. I teach poetry and um, printmaking. I do interesting little jelly prints, which they love. Uh, what's the jelly print? It's like a, a soft piece of jello that you put acrylics oh, on. Oh, I didn't realize that. And you take, oh ideally, translucent paper, makes it yeah. really beautiful, oh, like deli paper. Excellent. And you do little you backgrounds, and then you put all kinds of stencils, and you, we make our own stencils and put them down. And it can go on forever. But they have these, and then I make little books for them. Oh, so they put it all in their little books. So when they go home at the end, they have a little book full of poems and paintings, li their little paintings, and um, they really love that, the jelly. And they're writing their own poems as well. They write right? their own. I read yeah. them poems or give them ideas oh, or just do, talk just about magical yeah. gardens and, yeah. and yeah. magicians. If you were a magician, what would you, you know? Yeah. I just try to think of little magical things or talk about eagles or what they like, like what's That's interesting so to them, and then encourage them to write from that, and then to do paintings, and then do poems from their paintings and paintings from their poems. <laughs> then they have a little fat book full of goodies. Oh, that's, well, I know how much the kids love you because um, you've done some uh, classes for us at the Arts Council and getting their, their letters back and oh, it's just so beautiful. It's really powerful. The connection that they feel um, is, is really extraordinary to you and then also you really awaken within them. I've noticed this, um, th that whole sense of magic, but that they're creating that magic. And I think that's, that's the biggest surprise, is that not just that you're sharing the magic or magic is out there somewhere, but, but that also like... Encouraging it. Well, look, look what I did. You know, look what I created. I, there was nothing before, and now I have all this to share. And that's, that's very amazing. And remember the murals, those beautiful murals? I that do. We I, I remember them very um, That clearly. was fun, yeah. getting them all involved in that. Yeah. And mosaicing yeah. into, into the... Yeah. I love those, yeah. too. Well, it's just been so extraordinary to have this time with you today, Heidi. I really, really appreciated your willingness to come on by and to share all these wonderful poems. I know you have a lot more. We'll have to leave it here for now. But um, if people wanted to reach out to you or find out when's your next reading or, or how to get a hold of some of your work, mm -hmm. um, you have a, a beautiful website, too. Mm -hmm. And what's the actual address? Um, at www.heidimcgurran.com. Dot com. So that, that's an easy, easy one then. And um, so, again, thank you so, so, so much, and we'll look for you. Um, will you be doing more readings in the Monterey area, I do you think? I think so, yeah. Okay, we're going to watch for you. And okay. can you say the name of that consortium again? Monterey Poetry Consortium. So that is a really important mm -hmm. uh, one for us to remember, especially in the Poetry Month. And uh, Heidi, thank you so much for being here. Thank, thank you. you. This thank was you. fun. <laughs> Lots of fun. Thank, thank you. you.